Studies show that people who can count to five without saying one or three can also enjoy the new two, four, five breakfast deal at Hardee's with made from scratch biscuits. Bite into this deal only at Hardee's. Feed your happy. Tax not included. Available for a limited time at participating Hardee's restaurants. Price and participation may vary. Hey, it's Stuart Wright, the Britflix podcast host, and I'm cutting in again just to let you know this is the continuation of the Fright Fest preview series. And again, breaking with the tradition of the usual long form QA, this is six bite sized, spoiler free introductions to films that are playing. You will hear about Burial, Everybody Dies by the End, The Eyes Below. Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead, The Group, and Sorry About the Demon. Everyone is asked the same questions. Tell us who they are, what their role is on the film, a brief synopsis about the film, the kernel of the idea that led to the film that you're seeing today, their favourite memory from the shoot, a spoiler-free insight into the scene they're looking forward to most seeing with an audience at Fright Fest. And then finally, they're offering their tips to any rookie attendees to Fright Fest or simply saying they are rookie attendees and they're really looking forward to attending. Over to the filmmakers. My name is Ben Parker and I'm the writer director of Burial. Uh, Burial is set in the very last days of World War II and a group of Soviet soldiers are tasked with secretly smuggling the remains of Hitler out of Berlin and back to Russia, to Stalin. Uh, En route, though, they are attacked by German partisans called Der Werwolf in all manner of nasty ways. As the gist, it gets gets more violent and darker from there on. Uh, the initial the initial idea for the film came years and years and years ago when I was um, researching another film, another script actually about another sort of Russian figure called Andrei Vlasov. So I was absorbing lots of books about um, World War Two, Russian military, and I came across this footnote um, in one of the books uh, called Against Stalin and Hitler, and it it said that they buried the remains of Hitler to try and keep it hidden in the last days of the war. And I read that and I thought, oh, well, that's, I'd never heard that before. That was really interesting. I thought, oh, that's, that's an interesting visual as well. And I initially, cause it was like, you know, seven years ago, I thought we'd just make a really nice short film, like soldiers around a campfire talking about what they buried. Uh, and then I actually gave it to, I pitched it to my friend, Dan Martin, you know, Dan, special effects maestro, Dan Martin. And I said, um, how do you fancy making Hitler for me? He was like, yes, I'm in. <laughs> and then, and then it didn't, you know, we didn't do the short film, but then we, I did the chamber, which was my first feature. And then afterwards I sat down to write the feature script of this. I thought well, I might actually stand a chance of making it into feature. And so the second phase of it is writing the script, you know, the influence and inspiration of all the shit that was going on in the world at the time in 2016 various different things i don't know if you remember there was um brexit vote and donald trump getting into power and um you know fucking dickheads with tiki talk torches marching in the streets so i thought i wanted to say something about that so i thought i sit down write that script with that visual idea about that kind of stuff about burying lies or telling lies burying truths and the pernicious effect of hiding the truth and telling lies throughout history, all wrapped up in a nice, you know, violent thriller. And all the shoot is is a great memory. I think we shot in COVID, we shot during COVID, and I was amazed that nothing bad happened because of COVID, which was a miracle. Uh, and I think... It was difficult to shoot and stressful. It was one of the most stressful things I did. But, I mean, I loved every minute of it. Every every day that you're shooting a film is better than the best days trying to get the film together. 
that was the nightmare. Those are the sort of most horrible moments trying to get the thing made. So every day it was a, it was a lovely moment. But I think one particular day I we, we burnt down a barn, an entire wooden barn for real. That was pretty special. I think when you can do something real like that and it looked spectacular on camera, that's that's a wow moment for everybody, not just the director, everybody and the and the crew. That was a nice day. Nobody got hurt. I think the wind didn't shift. A few singed eyebrows, but other than that. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it with an audience at Fright Fest because um, there are some nice jumps and scares in the film. And that is always great to see with a live audience. I mean, that goes back to my first experiences in the cinema. That, you know, what, what I enjoyed, what I remember most about going to the cinema when, you know, whether it's like... Um, you know, Ben Gardner's head coming out of the bottom of a boat in Jaws or something. The whole cinema goes crazy. There are a couple of moments in the film that, that hopefully people jump out of their seat and that, that would be really nice to see live with an audience. Um, I think I remember like one of my first Fright Fest experiences actually was to see The Orphanage by Guillermo del Toro and seeing the whole crowd like leave their seats when this old lady gets hit by a car it's spoiler alert uh it was fantastic just one of the reasons i just kept on coming back it was such a nice experience to to see that with an audience so i won't spoil where they come and what they are but yeah i'm definitely looking forward to those bits my number one tip for rookies at the festival um pack some chocolate probably <laughs> It's, I mean, if you're seeing a lot of films back to back, it's always um, good to to pack some. I mean, it's I wouldn't pack nuts because there's too many people with nut allergies now. So maybe pack a bar of chocolate just to keep the energy levels up, stay hydrated. But also, I mean, on a serious, maybe a serious note, talking to people, you know, making making an effort to sort of talk to other people there. Whether you like the film, what do you think of the film? Got any recommendations? What did you see? It's going back to that that experience of seeing things with a with a real audience. I think it's nice to take that chance that you take the opportunity that you're seeing the same films as as everybody else. You know, when you come out like, oh yeah, you know, what do you like about that? That's that adds to the whole experience. I am Ian Tripp, the writer and director of Everybody Dies by the End, and co-produced it and played one of the many characters in it. Hi, I'm Ryan Schaefer. I co-directed, helped with the story, produced, and I acted in it. And the title of the film is Everybody Dies by the End. The film is a mockumentary about a fictitious horror director named Alfred Costella, who has been in exile for the past 10 years, and he's just resurfaced to make his 10th and final film titled Everybody Dies by the End. And there is a documentary crew who are here to chronicle the making of that film. The kernel of the idea came from a couple places. The initial idea was the character and the concept, which is a horror director who's going to do actual horrific things to make the, the horror end goal. And then that just came from, you know being in a in a more woke time to talk about the sort of like malevolent behaviors of you know getting a, a means to an end in in filmmaking as to actually mistreat people for the end goal of creating horror uh, the creed films are a good one what we do in the shadows is is one of the more poppy ones that we really like and then some of the, the deeper cuts that inspired the movie are movies like Street Thief and Man Bites Dog. Basically, all movies where a documentary crew chronicles someone evil. <laughs> I, I have one of them is not exactly on the shoot, but it was the night that we signed Vinnie Curran on the movie. Uh, Ryan and myself met with Vinnie and his girlfriend, and we just had drinks for like about 90 minutes. And then he had questions like, how does he wrap his his head around a character like this? And we were kind of worried, like, oh, shit, is he not going to be able to, like, get into the headspace of this? And then by the end of the night, we were we were all cheersing that uh, he was going to do the movie. So we had a day where we had a struggle with a certain effects tool just busted up and not working. And it was a situation of fake blood. Yeah. Which is notoriously hard <laughs> yeah. to get working. 
And it took a lot of finessing, a lot of hours, just, you know, fidgeting with it. There was a cracked pressure hose. Yeah. And uh, eventually we got it working and we're just fingers crossed, hoping everything would come together. And we just got the perfect shot and everyone looked at each other and was like, oh, we got it. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I remember so, when the moment was going live and I was behind the cameraman and I looked to Ryan, his fingers were crossed. My fingers were behind my back crossed. And then when the blood went flowing, we were all just like, thank, thank the film gods. That opening scene, the, the, uh, the mock interview scene, the public access interview, we shot that in December of 2018. So that's the scene we've been with the longest. And I just think it's a really fun scene. And I can't wait to see how... Uh, what bits people react to. I'm excited to see people see just a lot of the little confessionals we have and see the laughs and reactions that, you know, a lot of my friends that are actors got just to see their reactions to the little my new choices they made. Look forward to that a lot. The honest truth is uh, we're the rookies and, and <laughs> we're looking for the tips. My name is uh, Alexis Bouchon. Uh, I am the writer and director of a feature film called uh, The Eyes Below. Yeah, uh, the synopsis is very simple. <laughs> uh, it's a story of uh, a journalist, a man uh, named uh, Eugene or Eugene. Uh, and uh, he simply go to uh, to bed, goes to bed. Uh, he fell asleep, and um, something at uh, just a little moment after he's sleeping, he's in his bed. Something uh, goes into. He feels something inside uh, the bed, inside the che- under the sheets, and they discover that something is uh, attach- attacking uh, in uh, in his uh, in his bed. Uh, so it's a very simple, a little bit, uh, we, you could, we can say, cliche uh, start, starting point. But after that, of course, you have uh, many, uh, you have all the story with, uh, with that. The starting point uh, was uh, painting, in fact. Uh, painting called The Night by a Swiss uh, artist from the 19th century called, uh, named uh, Ferdinand Odler. Uh, it's very close to the, the famous uh, Fosley uh, uh, painting called the Nightmare, you know, with a, the sort of a monster on the belly of, the, of a woman. But here, it's um, it's a painting I discovered in a little uh, Larousse en- encyclopedia uh, when I was a child. Uh, it represents a man uh, naked lying on the on the floor with many other people uh, also naked, but it's a very weird ambience, in fact. And you have just a black sheet at the top of his uh, of his body, uh, uh, and you um, uh, you guess there is a, a monster or a sort of creature just uh, on uh, on his uh, his body, and he's totally scared. And uh, uh, I was totally uh, fascinated by this image when I was a child. And uh, uh, I discovered after uh, a teenager, uh, uh, a Japanese legend, uh, it's called the Kyobozu. It's and it, exactly the same thing uh, in the Japanese legend. It's a monster who goes in the woman's uh, bedroom to lick uh, her face, uh, the faces, and uh, scared the, 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 the woman, woman and after the, the man. And which fascinated me, it's that you have two uh, different, very different cultures and exactly the same uh, images, uh, the same legend, the same uh, text about it. Uh, so it was uh, the, um, the starting point. The other starting point was a very realistic uh, one because I wanted to make a thriller, uh, a realistic thriller with twists and turns in a very, very closed um, uh, set. I think there is uh, there are a lot of uh, indirect influences uh, in the film and uh, particularly uh, I think there is... Um, uh, films by uh, a Japanese uh, director called uh, Kaneto Shindo. It's a director from, from the 60s. I, I love his, uh, his work. And uh, especially two films, uh, one called Koroneko and the other uh, Onibaba. Uh, and by the way, uh, the, I uh, took um, uh, one of the sound uh, in, the, in Onibaba. It's also a rap. 
sort of, um, sound like that, and I distort it uh, for the for the film. So you, uh, so you you have a part of Annie Baba in the in the film. I stole it. Kaneto Shindo is a real reference because he totally speak with uh, the camera. He even did the famous film called The Naked Island without uh, any dialogues. And uh, my film has no dialogues. Uh, the important was to tell a story through uh, images to work with uh, uh, very simple tools uh, and cinematic tools like uh, the editing, the lights, uh, the angles, uh, and uh, most of all the movements. So to respond to answer your question, uh, Onibaba and uh, Kuroneko are very are very important in terms of uh, fear uh, because you don't. I hesitate at the beginning to make a very uh, gorish or violent film uh, like, uh, for example, uh, Fuji. Uh, I had some. Uh, uh, you had some. Um, the, the New York Reaper, for example, which is a very, very punk movie uh, that I, I totally love. Uh, I'm a big fan, for example, of, of Pascal Logier. So it's more violent and uh, gorish uh, directors. But I think I thought uh, finally the best way was uh, the contrary to be very uh, evocative, uh, to play with the image and ambience of fear, uh, but not um, uh, violence uh, itself. Uh, my favorite moment, uh, I'm, I have to, okay, it will be a, a little uh, naive to say that, but uh, I loved every moment. Uh, it's both uh, torture and pleasure to, to, make, uh, to make a film, and especially when you make, uh, you're making um, uh, a very independent <laughs> film, and, uh, and this one, and all the, uh, the three films here are very, very uh, independent. So uh, the good thing is that you suffer a lot, but you uh, you take a lot of pleasure in every steps. Concerning the shooting itself, maybe uh, the scene. Uh, it's difficult to uh, to say. Let's say the 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 worst scene uh, to to, ma to make was the corridor scene because it was uh, built in an actual uh, uh, cor house corridor, and. Um, so we had to build the impression that the corridor was infinite. And in fact, it was just uh, six or seven meters uh, uh, of sheets uh, um, uh, in a, with a, a wood, uh, wooden structure. And it was an absolute nightmare because uh, we had to, uh, to shoot uh, in this very tiny space uh, with all the light in the same way. So you had the shadows of the light every time on the, um, uh, on the frame. So it was a little bit uh, complicated. I think there is uh, two, I think the, the horror, I, I'm a big fan of uh, horror uh, uh, movies. So yes, uh, scary, it's, uh, it's, I have to say it's a thriller uh, uh, and a fantastic thriller, uh, first of all, and you have some elements of uh, horror in, uh, in it. But I think the oniric and nightmarish uh, 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 moment with the enemy, uh, I think, yes, it's what I, uh, I expect the most from the, from the audience. Uh, so for example, the moment, the first apparition of the enemy in the bed, uh, and with the end, etc. I hope it will uh, it will works on the uh, on the audience. And uh, same thing with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the attack of the enemy at one uh, at one point. Uh, but I don't want to spoil <laughs> the the story too, too much. Oh, uh, it's uh, difficult to say <laughs> uh, because because of the COVID, uh, I didn't uh, make uh, a lot of uh, festival uh, in physics uh, in person. Uh, so Fright Fest will be a big experience for, for me because it will be the, the biggest uh, um, uh, festival uh, I, I will attend. My name is... Pat Higgins and I'm the writer and director of Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead. Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead is a musical comedy horror uh, featuring feel-good, toe-tapping hits, heartwarming romance and a body count. Um, it follows a young woman called Emily who is played by Charlie Bond and she 
He's trying to get over her weird phobia of cheerleaders by becoming one. It makes sense in the context of the movie. She assembles an unconventional cheerleading group who enter a TV talent show and then accidentally turn their rivals, a squeaky clean boy band, into zombies using a cursed charm. There are 12 songs, including I'm Just a Guy Dying on the Floor. There's a whole bunch of gory fun, and basically it's our tribute to all of the, the less serious horror and musicals that have uh, made our lives so much better over the last few decades. The initial kernel for uh, the initial kernel of an idea for Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead was that I, I basically was going to abandon it. It was one of about six projects that I had on my kind of in development pile. It was basically the crazy title and a very, very, very rough idea and not much else. I tweeted that I was going to abandon it and got a response almost straight away from the brilliant Charlie Bond, who's both our lead and our producer, saying, no, you're not going to abandon that. We're going to make it. Um, she then proceeded to start tweeting other people going, if we can pull this together, would you like to be involved? And I said, yes. Um, and lo and behold, by the end of the day, suddenly the project was actually moving forward. Um, so it went from being a kind of crazy title and a very rough idea to being a go project remarkably quickly, all thanks to, to Charlie, really. Um, um, and so before I knew it, we were kind of hacking together a plan for how we could actually take this forward and turn this gory musical daydream into a wonderful Technicolor reality. I'd say a good comparison, uh, um, a key influence on Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead, because I will say the full title every time. Sometimes people will say Power Tool. I'll say, no, let me stop you there. Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the boy band of the Screeching Dead. I'd say that there are little little bits of Little Shop of Horrors, uh, Evil Dead, louder guitars, though, definitely. It's quite a kind of, if it were to be a dessert, it's quite a light, sunny Sunday of a movie, but it's got a little drizzle of bleakness sauce just over the top, and some blood, obviously, because you need that on any ice cream sundae. Um, but yeah, in terms of movies, it, you've got somewhere between The Sound of Music and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we're kind of sitting there plugging in our guitars and getting blown back across the room like Marty McFly in Back to the Future. It's something like that, somewhere around that area. I think, funnily enough, my favourite memory from the shoot is probably the original Kickstarter. We did one day's shooting, um, which was just manic. We got together. Any of the cast who'd sort of agreed in principle to, to be in it, provided we could get the, the uh, budget together, um, our fantastic director of photography, Al Ronald. We had uh, James Hamer Morton, who's going to be the lead of the, the boy band. And we all kind of got together um, and we had one day of filming people delivering lines. We had people being interviewed. We had uh, we kind of did a, a quick music video for one of the songs. It was just this frantic, mad day that felt like absolutely brimming with possibilities. And we did so much work on that day that we then drip fed out through the 30 days of the crowdfunder for it. And we got to be the number one uh, Kickstarter film project in the world off the back of, of what we shot. Um, not not forever, obviously, but on, on a couple of occasions during October 2020, we were number one out of, and I think this number's right, out of 74,592, we got to number one. So, so that day felt so brimming with promise and and it felt like the seed for everything that followed so i think that's probably my favorite memory from the shoot i think the moment i'm looking forward to seeing with an audience most is there is a song around about the midpoint um that i think kind of captures the tone uh of, of where we're going which actually is a title that's knocked around quite there, there's a song called i'm just a guy dying on the floor which i think uh, encapsulates something of the spirit of the movie. And there's also um, that song that we did for the the Kickstarter, which is called Intros to Death Scenes, which has actually got some of the bleakest lyrics I've ever written in my life. And it's quite nice to have something that's kind of bleak, but kind of showbiz. There's something, there's something that appeals to me about that. And so I'm really, really, those two songs in particular, I'm really looking forward to seeing with an audience and seeing how they play. Uh, Intros to Death Scenes is over the kind of finale stuff um and i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing how that lands because i say it, it's <laughs> if you just look at the lyrics i can remember sending the lyrics through just getting jesus pat are you okay <laughs> um but somehow once it's there with you know a combination of terrible bloodshed and spangly dresses it all kind of <laughs> it kind of makes visual sense but but yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays with an audience the, the movie's full of them really i think it's such an odd flick um, I can't wait to see it with an audience that hopefully enjoy it. 
I think make the most of every moment. I, I think the uh, horror festival audiences in general and the Fright Fest audiences, are, from my own experience of it, are just wonderful. It, it's a wonderful environment to see movies in. And I think that if people can just drink that in as much as, as possible, grab every opportunity to smile at people and say hi um, and all of that and just sort of soak up that kind of atmosphere. I think uh, it, it's so great. It, I, I think that horror festivals, as I said, I know I'm biased. I think other film festivals can come close, but they can never really touch a horror festival firing on all cylinders. For me, it's one of the best environments in the world. And so I think for anybody who's, who's not been before, the people around you are often, you know, particularly if you're in the same seat for the entire festival, the people around you are, are friends you haven't met yet. And to just go into it with a, a big grin, waiting to see some fantastic movies. Hi, I am Will Heiger, and I'm the writer and director of the group. So the group is a film about Kara, a recovering heroin addict, and she's returning to a support group that she washed out of previously to make amends for a past sort of tragedy. However, on the night she turns up, there's a new member in the group who quickly pulls out a gun and takes everyone hostage. Now, it becomes clear that this guy, Jack, has a connection to the group and something in their past relates to why he is there. So they have to try and dig into their own trauma and their own past to try and work out what it is that he wants and why he's there and to survive the night. So the initial... Well, the idea came from um, I'd been to a few uh, addiction support groups with family members and I'd noticed the sort of dynamics in there were quite sort of intriguing, not quite what you'd expect. You had quite a lot of varied people all, all there to sort of, um, you know, do the recovery, do the steps. But oftentimes they only had, really had one thing in common and that was their addiction. You know, so there was a lot of like clashing unexpected friendships and at the time I was looking to develop a sort of contained like micro budget film I was looking for a kind of like a uh, situation that would be right for drama and I thought to myself well you know like you've already got the drama in a group you've already got the clashing personalities the sort of like you know, characters that don't like each other, the interpersonal relationships and what would happen if somebody just went into this safe place, pulled out a gun and just turned everything on its head. And from there, we started developing the idea of this, of the film. Yeah, so my producer saying, I mean, it's already a situation that's ripe for drama. And then you just sort of were like taking it up a notch. And again, it was just a way of... Um, if you're trying to do something contained, you're looking at all these like bottle episodes, I guess, you know, like where you literally have one environment, something you could feasibly do. We didn't have a lot of money. So you're basically like, well, you know, like what's your engine for the story? And we were like, well, you can boil it down very quickly to one room. You know, what can we afford? Nothing. We can afford people talking, you know, and you've got this sort of, I mean, it's not even a room. You're very quickly like reducing it, reducing it, reducing it to a circle, just people sat around. Um, and that was kind of like quite sort of, you know, it's quite a dynamic situation. We thought, well, yeah, we could, we could do that. We can do that. We can make it look good. We can keep it dramatic and keep it punchy. And, you know, like without sort of overstretching ourselves, but also without it feeling like, you know, we're not doing a self-contained situation where there's, everybody's going to be like, well, why haven't they left the room? You know, like, what was it? Uh, Carnage, the Roman Polanski film, which is set in a flat, has a joke, doesn't it, where everybody's trying to sort of, like, leave. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa just, just one second. And we were like, well, at least now we're tying people to chairs. We know that that's not going to happen. And we know that nobody's going to ask him the question of, well, where, why are they not leaving? <laughs> so there were a couple of influences on the group whilst I was writing it, bar the sort of real-life inspirations. One of them is probably less obvious is that, my favourite film of all time is Alien. And, you know, and surface-wise, there's not really much in common other than, you know, a monster comes into a contained environment and messes stuff up. But it's a film I've always admired for its directness. There's not a right lot of fat. It's just, you know, well, it's like people on a spaceship, a monster stalking them. There's a background and lore if you want it, but it's not really the focus. It's just very tight, focused storytelling. And then the actors involved just make 
the most of the cat of like you know simple characters they make the most of them you know like the director makes the most of it visually and it was that kind of directness that i thought yeah we need we need that in the script we don't need faff we don't need like flashbacks and mountains and mountains of backstory you can just imply a lot and just keep it focused and direct and you know we just want to deliver like a quite tense ride for the audience um also when we were developing i mean we're developing it we pretty much watched any film that was set in one room or one environment so i think we worked our way through all the cube films one to zero um or zero to two i guess um we watched Fermat's room like you know lifeboat anything like that but a key one was reservoir dogs Obviously, I know that the thing is, is that when you're talking about your key influences and you're saying things like, well, it's Reservoir Dogs and The Godfather is, uh, you know, people are being a bit high minded. But really, we watch Reservoir Dogs because just the way they use the space, the way Tarantino uses the space, the way he creates dialogue set pieces. Now, you know, you know you're not really going to be the master at it, but it's a way of doing action, like an action set piece, but it's just people talking. And that was really what we wanted to do with the group. We really wanted to have that. Like, you know, these tense moments that are based just around dialogue exchanges and just that shift of power and things like that. So really key influences were Alien and Reservoir Dogs. So favourite memory from the shoot was we shot for about 12 days, I believe. And you've got to picture it that it's a low budget film. We've got a cast and crew that are basically operating on faith at the beginning you know, we'd had all the meetings, but I think anyone can talk up a script and, you know, big make big promises. On the second day is when we shot the big sequence with Jack. So uh, Jack's introduction to the film, after he takes everyone hostage, he puts everyone tied up in a circle. He sits at the top of the circle and in one sort of tracking shot, sort of just push in as he sort of lays out basically what's going to happen. And it's two, three minutes of just him sort of talking to the group as you push in, push in, push in. It's a big moment and a lot of pages to get through of him just doing this scene. And we basically managed to nail it. It was one of those moments where everything sort of came together. And, you know, there were like people were applauding from the video village because I think up until that point, there was a big question about whether or not we could actually do it and I think after that there was no real question about what we were going it sort of gave everyone a bit of a enthusiasm to really sort of drive the film home and from that point everybody was on board I mean in that regard it, we had a very positive shoot in that there was very little clashing everybody was always on the same page key scene that I'm looking forward to seeing with the audience um, I'm going to be as spoiler free as possible at this point there is a scene towards the middle of the film where an event happens and some drugs are brought into the group and basically it's one of those scenes that is the sort of promise of the film you know it is like a key scene that sums up everything to do with addiction to do with redemption you know like all these competing motives going together and it's disgusting it's quite moving in some ways. It's quite intense. It's quite funny. There's like some comedy and it's all kind of mixed in there. And it's quite a sort of like, you know, gr gross and quite sort of grueling. But it is, a I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that lands with another audience. A few people that have seen it have been like, ooh. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a really kind of like big scene for us. And I think the cast did a really, really good job and felt probably pretty uncomfortable when we were doing multiple takes of it. So 20 years ago this year, I came to my first Fright Fest, which is a long old time. And I've learned quite a lot from them. And one of the points is probably contradictory, but it would be that if you're not enjoying something, don't be afraid to step out, you know, like, leave, you know, you don't want to create like a negative vibe in the room. And also you're going to be watching like nearly 20 odd films. So, you know, like pace yourself. The other thing would be, even if you think something's not going to be your cup of tea, I'd probably say give it a try because it's never actually, you know, like Fright Fest is a launching point for a lot of these films. So really, you'll only find out after Fright Fest which were the ones 
which are the big deal, which are the sort of cultural touch points and the ones that people will be talking about, you know, five years from now on the forums. So I would be simultaneously, don't be afraid to step out if you're not enjoying something, but also don't be afraid of something you've not heard of it, because this might be the point. This might be the sort of touch paper for it to really sort of take off. Uh, my name is Emily Higgins, and I'm the writer and director of Sorry About the Demon. Sorry About the Demon is about a heartbroken young man who finds himself uh, moving into a house that turns out to be haunted, but he's kind of too depressed from his breakup to really move out of that house. So it kind of has to tell the ghost. We have to make this work and figure it out. So it's uh, kind of a sweet, romantic comedy horror movie of this guy learning to live with these ghosts. The initial kernel of the idea was that uh, I thought it would be really entertaining to kind of use ghosts in a haunted house as symbolism for dealing with your own self-doubts about who you are and who you want to become and kind of how you can become your own worst enemy and talk yourself out of, um, you know, your, your self-esteem. And uh, I thought channeling that with a breakup kind of uh, horror horror comedy was a very appealing idea to me. So that's that's where that all came from. A good comparison and key influence for me, this is going to sound strange because it is a comedy, but uh, I, I rewatched the Conjuring movies and the Insidious movies so many times leading up to and during production. And I just think they're so masterful in the character development and how they established this house. And our house was also, uh, well, I, I know some of those are probably existing sets, but our house was a built set. And with that, I was really uh, wanting to make sure that it was a set that you could really feel present in and not get confused by the geography. Of it. And I think that especially those Conjuring movies are so um, perfect with their set and, and feeling like you're living there with those characters. And so that was a huge influence for, for me. And in terms of the kind of breakup character aspect, of course, you know, Shaun of the Dead or Forgetting Sarah Marshall, just rewatching a lot of character driven breakup comedies where you don't totally hate the main character or think he's a man child. That was a really big thing for me. <laughs> and so there were kind of two aspects. What, what's the horror aspect? And I really looked to those Conjuring movies or the orphanage and the, the innocence. And then, uh, and then, of course, you know, Shaun of the Dead and, and Forgetting Sarah Marshall were kind of my main uh, breakup. Uh, examples. My favorite memory from the shoot was we had a very young child actor around 10 years old or so. She was so delightful to work with. She she worked really hard. She always hit her mark. Everybody loved her. And um, but she also had to give a very scary demonic, demonically possessed performance, but she was so cute. And she gets uh she gets ready to do her performance and she was just so good that people uh, applauded her after her first take and and it just everyone was so excited about how great she was in the film and um it, that really warmed my heart because it reminded me of what a collaboration and what a creative environment can look like when people are supporting each other and really lifting up a young performer who might you know who's just younger than everybody kind of stands out a little bit differently and and I just really loved that um sense of camaraderie everybody had to to really encourage her and and everyone was really excited too They're like oh this we can't wait to see her do this on screen so it was it was just a really nice moment of everybody feeling joyful the moment i'm looking forward to seeing with an audience is you know i think with a lot of horror movies you want to say oh this part that i think is really scary you know and with this movie because of the balance of humor i'm really looking forward to a couple of moments that I'm hoping people are going to laugh at because I feel like that's the that's the real challenge because especially with horror fans, it might be hard to scare them. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about actually scaring anybody with the comedic, uh, you know, elements of the movie. So what I'm really hoping for is uh, a couple of key moments where I'm, I'm really hoping people are going to laugh or chuckle at least a little bit, just or smile. I'll maybe I'll look around, see if somebody's smiling. And I guess that's that's a very vague description, but um, I'm I'm also hoping to see people. Um, uh, I guess like resonate with with the characters and what they've gone through because there's some sweet kind of grounded moments as well. My number one film festival tip for uh, kind of new attendees that would come more from attending film festivals because I love to go to film festivals and um, I, I found that I, I always feel lucky when I get to see a movie that's really small that that I knew nothing about with an audience uh, versus something that's a little bit bigger that I can maybe see soon uh, on, you know, streaming or in a theater. 
uh, sometimes it's tempting to see those early and it can be really fun to see those early with a big crowd, but there are these little gems that you would have never known about. And uh, those are some of my favorite festival memories. So that's what I would recommend. And so brings us to the end of Fright Fest Preview Part 3. You heard from Burial, Everybody Dies by the End, The Eyes Below, Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the Boy Band of the Screeching Dead, The Group, and Sorry About the Demon. Subscribe to Britflix wherever you get your podcast, and if you have time, please rate and review. Thank you.